I tell you, being out a couple of weeks and, and really without sort of that imminent pressure of knowing that you're coming to preach, um, I've been able to just fully soak in our worship the last two weeks, led by Brandon Hochstetler and our choir and our praise team and our musicians. And folks, let's never take for granted how good we've got it here with our worship. I'm awfully thankful for them. Can we give them a big hand this morning? Thank you. <clears throat> and let me say I am super, super glad to be back with you guys. It feels like it's been a long, long time. Um, many of you have asked me for an update regarding this, this retinal detachment that I had uh, some month ago now. Um, and, and just an update, the doctor feels it, it is healing well. The retina is adhered and is coming along. I still have this gas bubble in my eye that kind of helps the process. That should naturally dissipate, but it's taking up about a fourth of my vision now as opposed to half. So when I drop my, my gaze, uh, it takes up all my vision. So reading is still impossible with this eye, but uh, no more headaches and strain and all that. So it's getting better. Thank you so much for your prayers. And man, it's good to be back with you guys. How many of you glad you came this morning? Say amen. Amen. Good, good. I did want to tell you um, we're happy for him and we're sad for our church. Long time, long time faithful family in our church, uh, Buck and Gertrude Cumby. And Buck went home to be with the Lord uh, just a few nights ago. Uh, the viewing for Brother Buck will be Monday from 6 to 8 at Bean Massey uh, Funeral Home there on Beltline. That's 6 to 8 tomorrow night. If you can come, I know that would mean so much to the family to just come pay your respects. Uh, this, the ceremony will be a private one for the family on Tuesday. So 6 to 8 tomorrow on that um, and, and one final thing, of course, thank you, the beautiful decorations. We are here in the Christmas season. Terry Green and her team did a great job. Yeah. And I, and I wanted to echo what James said. My family's going to look at this as we've got one more family member to buy for for Christmas, and that's our community. Uh, we've got a bunch of folks over at Austin Elementary families with kiddos, they're, they're not going to be able to afford to give their kids a Christmas. And we've got a chance right here in our community to actually go into their homes on the 11th and give those kiddos and families a great Christmas. And, and so I'm going to encourage you to do what we're doing and say we're going to give the amount we would have given for a gift for one of our kids. We want to give uh, toward these families in need. So next Sunday, we're taking that special offering. Let's make sure and do a good one. We'd, we really need to do this right. We need around $5,000 to do it right. We've got so much need, so much that we want to do and, and can do. Uh, let's shoot for that Calvary family. And I know anytime the, char the charge is put out there for us, you guys always meet it, so that's great. We got guests all around the auditorium. I know our Hochstetler family is here. Uh, our own Debbie Lane is here. And if I, I miss somebody, it's just because I didn't get to see you before. But we're awfully glad that you're here this morning. Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> Luke chapter 11. We have been in a series for the past month that was entitled in the form of a question, why pray? Why pray? Statistically, most of the world doesn't pray very often. Statistically, most Christians don't pray habitually. And, and the question that we pose through the series is why pray? The last two weeks, we've been privileged to have uh, two of my best friends in the world come and elaborate to us, not only on why we should pray, but on what prayer should look like. I want to answer that question, God willing, in the final sermon of this series with a text that speaks so plainly that we cannot miss its intent. We cannot miss its promise. Why pray? Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. 
And Jesus said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, you probably know that as the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. You may be like, that's not exactly how I quoted it. Well, this is listed in another gospel as well with slightly different wording. But here you find this gorgeous account of the disciples hearing Jesus pray so powerfully. They, 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 they witness this amazing thing between God the Father and God the Son so much so. They say, Lord, teach us to do that. Notice, he was a powerful preacher, but they didn't ask him for preaching lessons. He was an amazing healer, but they didn't ask him for lessons on benevolence. In that moment, they said, Jesus, the most impressive thing about you is your prayer life. Show us how to do that. And he proceeds to give them not something they were supposed to pray in rote, but a pattern for prayer. We did an entire series on this pattern some years ago uh, called How to Pray Like Jesus. I want to encourage you, pick up that series. We'll probably revisit this content in the new year. This, however, is not where I want to spend our time this morning. I want to go on. Verse 5. And Jesus said unto the disciples, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity. That is a, a Greek word that is very, very rare Jesus is making a point when he uses that word, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. He won't give it to him because he's his friend, but because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many loaves of bread as he needs. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? It's a weird analogy, isn't it? But it's from Jesus, I shouldn't say it's weird. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Man, there's a lot in that text, y'all. I want you to get what this is saying so clearly you can't mistake it. So clearly that the only way to get around it is to say, well, maybe part of the Bible's true, and maybe part of the Bible's not true, and maybe Jesus is speaking figuratively in one section and literally in the next, and maybe what we have really isn't the inspired, inherent, infallible Word of God. Maybe they got it wrong. Listen, away with all that garbage. If this Bible is more than mythology, if Jesus is who he said he was, you can't mistake what he's saying here. He's saying to his children, to his disciples, to Christians, if you take your needs before God in prayer and ask for his provision to meet those needs, your God will meet them. All of them? Yes. All of them. Every single one. And he gets so distinct. It's almost as if the invisible interrogator is asking, Jesus, are you talking about physical needs? 
Because, I mean, we can spiritualize this. Do you mean physical needs? You'll meet those? Yes. He says in verse 10, Every one of you that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opened. And then he uses a physical example. If a son asks bread, will the father give him a stone? If he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? In other words, physical sustenance. God, I need it. Christ will meet all of your physical needs. He promised. This text is also saying that Christ will meet all of your spiritual needs. He promised. Verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? And the idea here is everything that the Holy Spirit has to offer, all spiritual blessings to them that ask him. And y'all, this is, this is really the tip of the iceberg. So much scripture are these promises. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jeremiah 33.3, call unto me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which you knew not. There are sections where Jesus told the disciples, listen, up to now you hadn't asked for anything. Ask and I'll give it to you. Why pray? Because Jesus promised God will answer. But here's the deal. We're not like drowning in amens right now. Right? We didn't just have like a spontaneous I showed up at the Oprah Winfrey show on the day she was giving away the gifts moment, did we? You ever seen people that are like just go like bananas, just like scratch, you know, just like free TV for you, free car for you, right? Nobody's that electric about the fact that we just said the God of all creation promised to meet all of our needs because truthfully, the question we're afraid to ask in church is, If that's true, why hadn't I experienced that? Brian, here's the deal. I've got some physical needs that have never been met. I have prayed and I prayed and I prayed, and truth be, you might have stopped praying. You might have given up praying. Because it just doesn't seem to have worked. You prayed for somebody to be healed, and they died. You prayed to get out of financial trouble, and like more stuff broke. You prayed for God to provide you some job opportunity, but you're still stuck in that same nine to five, dreading it every day. I meet people all the time that if they're honest, honest Christians, They say, why pray? I I don't know. A long time ago, I realized, and has he answered some of my prayers? Yeah, but there's a lot of them that seem to have gotten no higher than the ceiling. That's real. Maybe you're here today and you say, I've been praying for years for some spiritual need that has never been met. I prayed for victory over some sin, and I'm still struggling. Help with some addiction, I'm still failing some grace to be manifested. God, help me with my temper. God, please give me patience. God, please help me. I worry so terribly that it keeps me up at night. God, please do this work in my loved one. Please lead them to Christ. Please save them from destroying themselves. God, please send me some relief from this trial. But up till now, God hasn't answered your prayer. Y'all, listen. You know the, the, the thing that moves me increasingly at 41 years old about this poetry we sing, about this Christian faith, is it never calls on you to deny reality. Jesus never called on you to just take those icky feelings and cram them down somewhere and don't ask. Our God is so big he can deal with our questions. Our God is so fantastic. He didn't ask you to leave your brain in the foyer when you come into church. 
for a lot of us, there seems to be a marked difference between what we read by way of promises and what we have actually experienced in our life. It is terribly important. Listen, some of you don't have much of a prayer life, let's be honest, because you just don't see the point. And, and by the way, we always, we always talk about, well, I just don't know how to pray. I, I just, it, it feels awkward. I don't know how to do it. I, I, you know, I, I wish somebody could teach me kind of, do you start with adoration and then you move to thanksgiving and then you move to confession and we, we work out these little outlines in our mind and like, I just don't quite know how to do it. Let me tell you somebody who knows how to pray. A soldier in World War II laying in a foxhole with bullets flying past his helmet doesn't need any prayer lessons. He knows exactly what to do. When you're in a moment like I was in some years ago, when I was on whitewater rafting trip down the Akoi River, and we were in a hydraulic, that section of water, just sucking the boat down, and I fell out of the boat thinking, I got a life jacket on, I'll be fine. And I came up under the boat and couldn't get a breath, and when I did come up, that water was so chaotic. Honest to God, I thought, I'm not going to see another day, I'm a dead man. I didn't have one moment's notice on, should I start with adoration or request? I got like, articulate, man. <laughs> oh, God, save me, I'm drowning, right? The truth is, for a lot of us, we don't pray because we just don't really know if it does any good. I know that's not everybody in the auditorium, but that's some of us in the auditorium, and, I, and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. It is terribly important that we get answers to this question, why pray? Man, I had a quote that honestly, I was looking over a bunch of notes. I read it this morning, and it was just that spiritual thing that I needed today. And I, I believe it's from the Holy Spirit. I, I want to share it with you this morning. This is a guy named J.B. Phillips. It is impossible for people who have persuaded themselves that God has failed to worship or serve him in any but a grudging and perfunctory spirit. You get that? If you think God has failed you, it'll paralyze your ability to worship him. If you think God let you down, the only way to serve him is, and it's Sunday again. What has usually happened to such people is that they have set up in their minds what they think God ought or ought not to do. And when he apparently fails to tow their particular line, they feel a sense of grievance. God will inevitably appear to disappoint the man who is attempting to use him as a convenience, a prop, or a comfort for his own plans. God has never been known to disappoint the man who is sincerely wanting to cooperate with God's own purposes. Wow. Could it be, my friends, that rather than wanting a glorious, sovereign God who controls the universe and knows you on a level much deeper than you know you and is working purposes much higher than our comfort or the American dream, could it be that when we laid down our request and God failed to toe the line, when we called on a heavenly Santa Claus and asked him for exactly what we wanted this Christmas and he didn't deliver it, that we thought, what's the use? I want to give us a couple of thoughts this morning in relation to this idea of why pray. We're going to be continually frustrated and defeated in prayer 
until we realize a couple of things about it that come from our text, okay? How many of you still with me now? Say amen. First of all, we must be shameless in prayer. We must be shameless in prayer. That's a weird point. Verse 5, Jesus said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. A friend of mine in his journeys come to me. I have nothing to set before him. He from within shall answer and say, Don't trouble me. My door's shut. My kids are in bed. I can't get up and give anything to you. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his, there it is, importunity, he'll rise and give him as many as he needs. Importunity, this rare Greek word, literally means impudence, shamelessness, a lack of sensitivity to what is proper, impertinence, without modesty, without decorum. Here's the idea. Is, is this guy in coming at midnight, I, I got folks coming to my house and I got nothing to give them, which was just the worst in that culture in that day and time, not to have something on hand for guests. He shows up with no decorum, no shame. I, I'm in need. I got to have some bread. I know it's midnight, but I need something for these people that are traveling. And let me just tell you, for the longest time when I read this story, I thought this was the moral of the story, okay? Guy's down there, and he's like, I'm down here, hey, I need some bread. Leave me alone, my kids are in bed, this is weird, go home, I'm not gonna give you bread at midnight. No, I really need it, knock, 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 knock. Please, no, go home, please, all right. Gets up out of bed, puts his robe on, right, he's mad, throws some bread out the window. If so, what is the moral of the story? If you'll just bug your friend enough, he ain't really your friend, but if you just bug him enough, he'll give you what you want. I don't even know what you'd do with that in the Lord. If you just bug God enough, he'll give you what you want? Or somebody might spiritualize it and say, hey, God's so much better than this bad friend. If you bug him, how much more will he do, I guess? I don't think that's the point of the story. I read a, a sermon by an old, old British preacher named G. Campbell Morgan, which spun my view on this completely. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a friend who overestimates your relationship? You ever had a friend who overestimates your relationship? They think you're better friends than you think you are? I mean, like, you've met them, like, twice, and they'll call you up and ask you to help them move. Right? By the way, there are three levels of friendship in my mind, okay? Level three friendship is I will pick you up at the airport. That's a big deal, right? Level two friendship is I will help you move. Level one is kidney. I'll give you a kidney, right? Like, like help you move is almost kidney, but you got this person, you don't even know them that well. But I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and oh man, it's going to go out all over the thing, and don't be guessing who it is. Uh, there's a particular missionary <laughs> that whenever this individual comes in town, man alive, they, they always want to get together and run around and, and, and you know, go to a movie and do the thing, and I, I'm just like, we're not that close. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we're not that good of friends. But you know what? I always go. <laughs> you want to go out to eat? Uh, I've been, man, I've been missing you, buddy. We're like, you know, we, we haven't seen each other in months now, and we're, we're so close, and I, I was thinking of you every, you know. Yeah, all right, let's go eat. Yeah. The thing, it quit racking your brain to try to figure out who it is. That's wrong. Don't do that. Here's the thing, because they think you're that good a friend, you'll do stuff you would never do normally. This guy is up there in his bed with his kids, and this guy shows up and, 
I turn to you first because I know we're like brothers and I'm so sorry, but I need this thing. And the guy's thinking, like brothers, I don't even know you, man. But he still gets the bread and brings it to him. Here's the idea. God is saying, if you have a friend who overestimates your relationship, you'll do a lot for that guy. Even a mediocre friend, you'll give what they need because they overestimate your relationship. But here's the thing, you can't overestimate your relationship with God. He loves you more than you can possibly fathom. You know what the problem is in prayer sometimes, y'all? It is supposed to be relationship-based. It's not supposed to be so technical. If I love you and we sit down together, I'm not trying to map out. Part A of the conversation will be a greeting. Part B, we will talk about how Thanksgiving went. Part C, I will check on his family. I'm not doing that. We're friends. It's a relationship. It's an organic conversation of give and take. Maybe when God says, I'm your father, closer to you than your daddy, come to me. Come to me. You can't overestimate how much I love you. You know one of the greatest examples of this is you grandparents. Your grandkids are shameless when they ask you for stuff, aren't they? They will crawl right up in your lap and give you a kiss on the cheek and ask you like, Papa, would you buy me? And you're a sucker, man. You're so hard on, you're so hard on us and you're so easy on them. But that's your grandkid. The relationship, that kid knows. Grandma and Grandpa love me, and they got resources. <laughs> so I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. What is Jesus telling us? You can't overestimate how much he loves you. It is born out of a relationship with God, true prayer. I'm going to have to move quick here. Here's the second one. Not only <coughs> you must be shameless in prayer, you must be persistent in prayer. Luke eleven nine, 9. I say unto you, ask, that's a Greek uh, word that's in the present imperative tense. Here's what that means. It means keep on asking, and it shall be given you. Seek, or keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock, keep on knocking, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that keeps on asking receives. He that keeps on seeking finds. He that keeps on knocking, it shall be open. Listen, even when you're persistent in prayer, God may make you wait a while. The old saying is very true. God's timing is not our timing. And there have be, been times, i got to be honest with you, I've wondered, even lately I've wondered, God, why do you make me wait? Why do you want me to keep on knocking? I, I mean, God, do I have to coerce you? Does God simply like to be begged? No. Persistence in prayer is not an attempt to change God's mind but to get ourselves to the place where he can trust us with the answer. God always, listen to me, God always has more in mind than simply meeting your need. It is always his goal, listen to me, if you don't get anything else today, it's always his goal to have you meet him in the middle of your need. I think of Job sitting on that ash pile. God could have let him lose his family, lose his wealth, lose his health, have two days of pain, and give it all back to him. But God makes him wait and wait and wait. Why? We don't know all the reasons why. We do know God is getting glory over Satan himself. We do know this is going to be a story that for the rest of creation, we're going to look to when we're suffering. But here's one thing we also know. Job comes to the point. His heart has had this marination process. 
this germination process in the trial, in the pain, with the pseudo friends. This thing has happened in his heart where when God shows up in the whirlwind, Job is ready to hear him. Listen, whatever he's working in you, he's not just working the thing you think about, the thing in your focus. There's all sorts of stuff taking place. And sometimes that takes time. Jeremiah 29, 11. Somebody hear this today? This is God speaking. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go to me and pray, and I will hearken unto you. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. The great old preacher Vance Havner once said, sometimes you can't get all of God that you want till he's all that you got. I wonder how many Christians, man, us, not, not, not you, us, we come to God with some need, and then when provision isn't immediately granted, or it's not granted in the way we thought it should be granted, we run out and just try to meet the need ourselves. We pray for God to give, them fulfillment, give us fulfillment, then we'll run right to the refrigerator or the TV to meet the need. We'll pray to God for help in our marriage, then we'll run right into somebody else's arms to meet the need or run to a computer screen to meet the need. We'll pray for God to help us at our job and then promptly quit that job on an angry whim to meet the need. Folks, we will never get far with God until we cut away option B and option C and option D and option E and do what the Bible calls seeking his face. One more thought. <clears throat> Man, this is important. We must be flexible in prayer. I think this is one of the biggest ones. I'm telling you, standing here on this stage in front of you, I think that I know what I need. I can make a laundry list of stuff that I think God should do tomorrow. It makes sense, it's not unspiritual. I would thank him for it. It would, right? But here's the thing. We human beings with our limited foresight and our limited understanding and our limited knowledge, sometimes there's things that we want that we really don't need. Sometimes what you think you need is the exact opposite of what you really need. And, and God, I, you know, I've used this phrase more in the last five years. God is so brutally good. He won't let you talk him out of his plan. He won't give you second best, no matter how much you beg. He knows who you really are and what you really want and what will really count. He will answer your prayer at the base of your prayer. He understands that when you ask him to give you this, what you're really asking for is peace. And he's like, I'm not going to give you that because that would only last you 10 seconds. I'm going to give you what you're really looking for, peace. I'm going to give you joy. I want to give you satisfaction. And I won't give you something that will rob you of that in the end. There was a Confederate soldier, I don't know who he was, I don't know that history even records who he was, but this was found in his writings, and I think he was on to something. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I may learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I may do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I may be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. 
I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy my life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for but everything I hoped for. I am among all men most richly blessed. I wonder how many of you have walked with God long enough to thank him for some unanswered prayers. 